The existence of life on Earth is very delicately balanced in the scales of chance. The list of things that had to come out just right is enormous. Take, for example, the chemical elements. There had to be plenty of oxygen, carbon and hydrogen, but we wouldn't have wanted these things to combine together to make nasty substances like methane or ammonia, such as we find on other planets like Jupiter. Professor Davies adds to the list. On top of this, there had to be a very narrow range of temperatures, in this case supplied by the sun. This means that the sun has to be very stable and not flat up and down in its temperature. And the orbit of the Earth around it has to be very nearly circular. If gravity were a little weaker, we'd have lost all our atmosphere, like the moon. If it was much stronger, we'd break every time we fell over. And without that layer of ozone above our heads, we'd be exposed to deadly ultraviolet radiation. Uh, there's still the fact that the entire universe seems unreasonably suited to the existence of life, uh, almost contrived, we might say, a, a put-up job. What is at issue concerns the hidden, vital complex of particles and forces, the nuts and bolts of the universe that shape it and hold it in existence. Some of them, like the many so-called constants of the universe, may seem of interest only to those mathematicians, physicists and cosmologists who delight in them. Not so. Unless every element in this underlying foundation interlocked precisely, there would be no universe at all. It turns out that if you change just a little bit the laws of nature, or you change a little bit the constants of nature, like the charge on the electron, then the way the universe develops is so changed that it's very likely that intelligent life would not be able to develop. If we nudge one of these constants just a few percent in one direction, then stars burn out within a million years of their formation. No time for evolution. And if we nudge it just a few percent in the other direction, then no elements heavier than helium form. So no carbon, no life, not even any chemistry, no complexity at all. And if we could alter the relative masses of two of the subatomic particles, the proton and the neutron, by just a fraction of a percent, atoms would be unstable. There'd be no stars, no light, no warmth, no structure at all, just chaos. Well, take, for example, the so-called Big Bang, the thing that started the whole universe off. And that just wasn't any old bang. It was an exquisitely orchestrated affair, so that it's precisely uniform as we look around us in space. Now, if that bang had been less powerful, the whole thing would have come out and then collapsed back into a big crunch and gone out of existence long before now. On the other hand, if the bang had been more vigorous, everything would have been flung apart and completely dispersed and no galaxies would have formed and we wouldn't be here to talk about it. It turns out that when you look at the rate at which the universe is expanding, it's precisely on the dividing line between these two unpalatable alternatives. In the 1950s, well before anyone had invented the anthropic principle, Fred Hoyle was working out how the elements of which we are made were created in the nuclear furnaces inside stars. Stars are mainly hydrogen and helium, the simplest atoms of all. For the star to make carbon, three of its helium nuclei have to collide. Snooker players will tell you that happens very rarely. Far too rarely for the star to produce all the carbon we need in our bodies. But when two helium nuclei combine, if there's another helium close by, something strange happens. It's as if the target gets much fatter. So the likelihood of the third helium homing in on the right spot to make carbon is enormously increased. No other elements behave like this. This unique stroke of utter chance has enabled stars to manufacture enough carbon for our bodies. But that's only half Hoyle's story. If another helium hits the carbon, it'll produce oxygen. So why is there enough carbon left for us? Once more, nature has made a unique and fortunate choice. This time, the reaction is so far off-tuned to the energy available that only half the carbon is changed to oxygen. What were Hoyle's conclusions? A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a superintendent has monkeyed with the physics, as well as chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. 
I do not believe that any physicist who examined the evidence could fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed with regard to the consequences they produce inside stars.